my sense, and I did a lot of clinical work with high performing people and had a chance to observe them in academia among my peers, but also and among graduate students, but also in the broader business and professional world. And it takes a singular combination of traits to be a C-suite person or the equivalent. And one thing is uh, incredible um, efficiency and persistence. So not only are you working 80 hours a week, you do that all the time and you do it nonstop. So it's not like, you know, you talk to an undergraduate and he says, or she says, I spent eight hours in the library yesterday studying and then you do a little micro analysis and you find out that really they spent, you know, 40 minutes studying maybe and seven and a half hours wasting time. But the people that occupy those C-suite positions, they're actually working all that time and they've trained them. And well, they have the temperament, they're very likely to be conscientious. So they start with that. And perhaps that was also fostered in their household because that does help. So here's an example of that. So the children of first generation Asian immigrants are disproportionately successful. And it looks like the reason for that is something like uh, socialization for conscientiousness. And that seems to produce the equivalent of about a 15 point IQ advantage, which is about the difference between the typical college graduate and the typical university or high school graduate. It's a big difference. It's a big one standard deviation. So, so, you know, to be a CEO or to be hyper successful, you have to be, let's say two to three standard deviations or more above the mean for IQ. So that wipes out like 85% of the population right off the bat or 95% really. And then you have to be in the 95th percentile for conscientiousness and those are uncorrelated. So that's 5% of 5% with the first two cuts, you know, so, so there's, there's, a, there's a singular, singular personalities that end up in those situations. And I think, you know, that there's a, there's an added advantage that men have motivationally to pursue those jobs. And the advantage is that status confers upon males sexual attractiveness, status within the, the patriarchal hierarchy, let's say. So m women are much more likely to choose high status men, assuming that the definition of status is defined by the hierarchy within which they're competing. Okay. Men have zero preference for women who are high status in those in, in that way or actually the correlation is slightly negative. And so to be a CEO and be a woman um, means that you have to have all those personality attributes, but then you don't gain this tremendous reproductive advantage. And I think that advantage is so marked that it's actually built into men. It's not only motivating consciously, if I'm successful, I'll be more successful with women. It's built in biologically. Well, so, and you want status among your fellow males too. Like athletes compete against each other, uh, and, and you and you want to get the respect of your fellow males, say in your group. At least, I mean, speaking as a male. Look, I, I had this roommate. Um, he came from Alberta, like me, so he's a small town rural guy, uh, and he went to McGill and then went off to New York. He's very, very smart rough guy, very adventurous guy, um, went off to New York, became a corporate lawyer. And his plan was to go to New York, make a pile of money, and then go travel. Like he went up the Amazon, he went into China when he, when so few Caucasians had gone there that they had to put him in jail in one part of China because he got mobbed so badly, it was the only place, because people were curious about him, um, it was the only place they could put him that was safe. So in any case, he was going to go to New York and, and make a bunch of money and then be, be his adventurous self. But, you know, you go to New York and you adopt a, a job, one of those high pressure jobs in a, in a top law firm. And the socialization pressure is so intense. You, you've never experienced anything like it in your life. And if you do that for 10 years, you're a corporate lawyer. You're not whoever you were to begin with. Maybe the conscientiousness remains. And so I saw him about 15 years later. And it was so funny because when he walked into the restaurant, he had a you know, high powered New York suit on, it was really sharp looking guy. Uh, and he looked ex he looked the part exactly, exactly. And I thought, <laughs> geez, I look just like a professor because I had my tweed jacket on and my leather jacket. I was much more casual and I thought we really became what we pursued.
And so, and so th these trade-offs that you talk about, they're, they're real, right? They're real. You, you, you sacrifice much of what you could be for who you are going to be. And, and that's a good sacrifice because you should become something, but it's, it's still real sacrifice. I know a bunch of people who run MBA programs and I've had discussions with them because the thing about an MBA program is it's just, if it's selective, it's really hard to get in. It's like getting into Harvard. It's really hard to get into Harvard. You have to have an IQ that places you at least at the 99th percentile. And then you have to be really good at at least one or two other things. So it's really hard to get in. Okay, so you think, well, why hire a Harvard graduate? Well, it's the quality of the education. It's like, no, it's not. It's the fact that it's really hard to get in. All of the value of the Ivy League education is in the screening before the, before the, uh, before the education starts. Now, that doesn't mean that people, people go to Harvard and they get educated, but they'd get just as educated if they went somewhere else. First of all, it's like every university contains more information than any student can ever possibly process. If you're super smart, uh, you, you can be dropped into a state college somewhere, a low-level state college. You spend four years in the library. You know, like, what, what are you going to do, read the whole library? No. <laughs> right. So, so, and the data on this is quite clear. It's like... And it's the same with private schools. The reason that pri people who go to private schools do better than people who go to public schools is because, generally speaking, the people who go into private schools are smarter. It's not the education that's any better. And so we radically overestimate the degree to which training works. So now you can train people to be stupid, that's, but training them to be smarter than they are is really, really, really hard. So, it, like I said, it's a dismal literature. And liberals, see, the liberals think everyone's roughly equal, and there's a job for everyone, you just have to train them. It's like, no, wrong. And the conservatives think, well, there's a job for everyone if they just get off their ass and, look, and work. It's like, no, no, that's wrong too. Even though, if you work, that's better. And, well, so that, that's on the conservative end, but the liberals won't take into account individual differences. Well, obviously, that's part of what the whole politically correct discussion is about. It's like, everyone's the same. It's like, yeah, um, they're not. <laughs> You know, and I find it, it's really, it's really annoying, I would say. Like, I love, love to come to Silicon Valley. I've been here many, many times. And, like, it's really something to come here and, and, and meet. There's so many people here who are off the scales intelligent. And they're all, you know, clustered together, which is why this place is so unbelievably rich and so unbelievably productive, one of the reasons. But it's very, it's also very annoying that it's so left-leaning. Because one of the things that the left-leaning Silicon Valley geniuses should understand that is that they're the beneficiary of a genetic lottery mm -hmm. And they should take that seriously. It's like yeah. Yeah, you worked hard. Yes, you're entrepreneurial. Yes, you're on point You put in your 60 hours a week, you know, you do everything you could but you have an IQ of 150 and like that's not your doing mm -hmm. Right, that's something that happened to you. And so you can't be saying well, it's it's all me. It's like no yeah. It's not it's all you and the genius that you were granted as, a, as an infant. It's, that's it, that's what's driving it. Now, that, that doesn't mean, I think, that people of disproportionate intelligence shouldn't be rewarded disproportionately. It's possible that they should, because it might be in the best interest of everyone else to dump as much money as possible to the top 2% of the cognitive strata, because they're going to be most generative with it. And so, and even if it's not fair, because you might say, well, just because you won the genetic lottery, does that mean that you should have more money than anyone else? It's like, well, not on the grounds of fairness, but if you have to distribute money, well, who are you going to distribute it to? You know, and I think, was it Ted, who ran CNN? Ted Turner. He estimated that if you tried as hard as you could in your entire life, there was no way that you could spend more than $400 million. And so let's say you have more money than that at your disposal. Well, hopefully you're going to do some halfway intelligent things with it. And hopefully you'd expect that the more intelligent people would do more than halfway intelligent things with it. So if you have to have unequal distribution, then a meritocracy is probably the best way to do it. But it still leaves you with this terrible problem, which is what do you do with all the people who stack up at zero? And the answer isn't have contempt for them because they don't work as hard as you. It's like, yeah, a bunch of them don't. You know, because conscientiousness also predicts success. So among the poor, there are people who don't work. You know, but you never want to underestimate the contribution of cognitive ability. 
So it's rough, man, and, and we don't take it seriously, and we don't know what to do about it. And yeah. it's clear that as inequality increases, societies yeah. destabilize. That's clear. So it's something that has to be dealt with, and but we don't know how to deal with it. We don't know how to efficiently move resources to the bottom end of the competence hierarchy.